introductory verse and preface to henry d thoreau this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by lynn thompson henry d thoreau by franklin benjamin sanborn introductory verse and preface much do they wrong our henry wise and kind morose who name thee cynical to men forsaking manners civil and refined to build thyself in walden woods a den then flout society flatter the rude hind we better knew thee loyal citizen thou friendship's all adventuring pioneer civility itself would civilize whilst braggart boors wavering twixt rage and fear slave hearths lay waste and indian huts surprise and swift the martyr's gibbet would uprear thou hailst him great whose valorous emprise orion's blazing belt dimmed in the sky then bowed thy unrepining head to die a bronson olcott concord january eighteen eighty two preface when in eighteen seventy nine i was asked by my friend charles dudley warner to write the biography of thoreau which follows i was by no means unprepared i had known this man of genius for the last seven years of his too short life had lived in his family and in the house of his neighbour across the way ellery channing his most intimate friend outside of that family and had assisted channing in the preparation and publication of his thoreau the poet naturalist the first full biography which appeared not very long after thoreau's death channing had written me these sentences with that insight of the future which he often displayed Quote, that justice can be done to our deceased brother by me of course i do not think but to you and to me is entrusted the care of his immediate fame i feel that my part is not yet done and cannot be without your aid my little sketch must only serve as a note and advertisement that such a man lived that he did brave work which must yet be given to the world in the midst of all the cold and selfish men who knew this brave and devoted scholar and genius why should not you be called on to make some sacrifices even if it be to publish my sketch End quote this i was ready to do in eighteen sixty four and it was through my means that the volume then much enlarged by channing was published in eighteen seventy three and again with additions and corrections in nineteen o two i also had the great advantage of hearing from the mother and sister of henry the affectionate side of his domestic life which indeed i had witnessed both in his health and in his long mortal illness from emerson who had a clear view of thoreau's intellect and his moral nature i derived many useful suggestions though not wholly agreeing with him in some of his opinions in march eighteen seventy eight after hearing emerson read a few unpublished notes on thoreau made years before i called on him one evening and thus entered the event in my journal Quote, i was shown several of thoreau's early papers one a commentary on emerson's sphinx and another from his own translation of the seven angels the seven against thebes written at william emerson's house on staten island in eighteen forty three of this episode in thoreau's life his tutorship for six months of william emerson's three sons emerson told me that his brother and henry were not men that could get along together each would think whatever the other did was out of place this was said to imply that thoreau's poem the departure could not have been written on his leaving castleton in staten island i had shown emerson these verses first printed by me at sophia thoreau's wish in the boston commonwealth of eighteen sixty three whereupon he said i think thoreau had always looked forward to authorship as his work in life and finding that he could write prose as well he soon gave up writing verse in which he was not willing to be patient enough to make the lines smooth and flowing these verses are smoother than he usually wrote but i have now no recollection of seeing them before 
nor of any circumstances in which they may have been written alluding to judge hoare's marked dislike of thoreau emerson said there was no bow in henry he never sought to please his bearers or his friends thomas charmondly the nephew of scott's friend richard heber meeting henry at dinner at emerson's to whom charmondly had letters in eighteen fifty four and expressing to his host the wish to see more of him emerson said he told the englishman if you wish to see thoreau go and board at his mother's house she will be glad to take you in and there you can meet him every day he did so added emerson and you know the result this led to further mention of mrs thoreau who emerson said was a person of sharp and malicious wit of whose sayings he read me some instances from his journals among these was her remark to mrs emerson henry is very tolerant adding mr emerson has been talking so much with henry that he has learnt henry's way of thinking and talking emerson went on to me i had known henry slightly when in college the scholarship from which he drew an income while there a farm at pullen point in chelsea was the one that i and my brothers william and edward had enjoyed while we were at college but my first intimate acquaintance with henry began after his graduation in eighteen thirty seven mrs brown my wife's sister who then boarded with the thoreau family in the parkman house where the library now stands used to bring me his verses the sick vita and others and tell me of his entries in his journal here is the index to my journals in which thoreau's name appears perhaps fifty times perhaps more End quote thus far my journal of eighteen seventy eight i was myself introduced to thoreau by emerson march the twenty eighth eighteen fifty five in the concord town hall one evening just before a lecture there by emerson from that time until henry's death may the sixth eighteen sixty two i saw him every few days unless he or i was away from concord and for more than two years i dined with him daily at his mother's table in the house opposite to Ellery Channing's I thus came to know all the surviving members of his kindred his eccentric uncle Charles Dunbar his two aunts on each side Jane and Maria Thoreau and Louisa and Sophia Dunbar both older than mrs. Thoreau and the descendants in Maine of his aunt mrs. Billings long since dead his sister Helen and his brother John I never knew but learned much about them from their mother and sister for neither Henry nor his father often spoke of them Sophia also placed in my hands after Henry's death several of his poems which I printed in the Commonwealth and Emerson gave me other manuscripts of Thoreau which had lodged with him while he was editing the dial he had urged Sophia to leave all the manuscripts with me but her pique against Channing at the time prevented this she knowing him to be intimate with me With all this preparation I received from mr. Blake to whom Sophia had bequeathed them in 1876 the correspondence of Thoreau and his college essays with some other papers of Henry's and his own But without the replies from the family to Henry's affectionate letters Even his own to his mother and sisters had been withheld from publication by Emerson in 1865 when a small collection of Thoreau's letters and poems was edited by Emerson this omission Sophia regretted as she told me and finding them now in my hands though I made use of their contents in writing the biography I withheld them from full publication foreseeing that I should probably have occasion to edit the letters in full at some later time and I made but sparing use of these early essays on the other hand i perceived that the character and genius of thoreau could not be well understood unless some knowledge was had of the concord farmers scholars and citizens among whom he had spent his days and who have furnished a background for that scene of authorship which the small town of concord has presented for now more than seventy years therefore having access to the records and biographies of the concord social circle then in preparation for the public and to many other records of the past in new england i sketched therein the character of our interesting community which gave color and tone to the outlines of this thoughtful scholar's career 
but i held back for the familiar letters the more intimate details of thoreau's self-devoted life and did not draw heavily on the thirty odd volumes of the journals to which at worcester mr blake gave me free access it was then his purpose to bring out these journals much earlier and more fully than was done until mrs houghton mifflin and company published their admirable edition in fourteen volumes a few years ago after mr blake's death the success of my biography written under these limitations has more than justified reasonable expectations it was popular from the first and is still widely read and called for by a generation of readers quite distinct from those for whom it was originally written since the spring of eighteen eighty two when it was published many details of thoreau's life and that of his ancestors have become known by an examination of his copious manuscripts of the papers of his loyalist ancestors and his father's relatives in the island of jersey and by the publication of some twenty-five volumes from thoreau's own hand he never employed an amanuensis and he seems to have carefully preserved the large mass of his manuscripts which accumulated during his literary life of some twenty-five years the exceptions to this remark were the copies of his earlier verses which he told me in his last illness he had destroyed because they did not meet emerson's approval and those pages of his journals which he had issued in print books or magazine articles fragments of his youthful verses were kept however by some of his family and still exist from all these sources many things have come to light concerning his ancestry and the minor events of his life which i hope eventually to give the world in a final biography that will serve as a sequel to this one the greatly enhanced reputation which thoreau now enjoys as compared with his fame in eighteen eighty two seems to warrant a detail which was not then needful and which even the familiar letters does not furnish much misconception of his character and the facts of his life still prevails and singular statements have been made in textbooks as to his origin and training one authority described thoreau as descended from farmer folk in connecticut who were recent immigrants from france so far as i know not a single ancestor of his ever dwelt in connecticut they were all merchants and though his thoreau ancestors spoke french or a patois of it in jersey there is no evidence that any of them had lived in france for more than five centuries this initial authentic biography with its few errors corrected now comes forth in a new edition which will long be found useful in the manner indicated and i hope may be received as the earlier edition has been with all the favour which its modest aim deserves f b s concord massachusetts october the eighth nineteen o nine end of preface